talk on Webpack using it in WordPress. Uh, there's sort of two parts to this presentation. For the first part, I'm just going to go through um, some high-level stuff, kind of explain what, what Webpack is, what it's similar to, what it's used for. And in the second part, um, I've actually set up um, my Webpack configuration file. And I'll take you step-by-step step through how you manage the configuration file to do various things. And there's a public repo with the configuration in there that I uh, have a link for at the end of the talk, so you can download it and you can play with it on your own as well. A um, little bit about me. Um, I am a father. My wife, Amber, here is with our youngest daughter. Um, we have five other kids at home. Um, I am a developer. You know, I really love writing code. Um, this is a very tech-heavy talk. Um, I'm a homesteader. You know, we have 10 acres up in Nevada City. We designed and built our own house, and it's just been a wonderful experience for us and for our kids. Um, and I like to do a lot of uh, backpacking um, now with my kids as they're getting older, um, and camping, and just really kind of getting out there and enjoying the wilderness. So I'm curious, how many people here have heard of Webpack before? Okay, a handful. How many people have used Webpack? Okay, cool, then great. I'm glad that you guys will all learn something. Um, so what is Webpack? According to the documentation, Webpack is a static module bundler for modern JavaScript applications. That's kind of a mouthful. You know, what, what does that really mean? It means squirrel? No, I, I think the squirrel wants to know also. <laughs> <laughs> so, what Webpack does is it takes a bunch of various assets, images, JavaScript, CSS, and combines them all together into a single JavaScript package. So it, it, it does a lot of things in addition to while it's doing that, but at the end of the day, you have a bunch of various things on one side, and at the end it comes out a nicely formatted package that's mostly JavaScript. And so you may be wondering to yourself, you know, a JavaScript package, we deal in WordPress, you know, that's HTML, CSS, JavaScript is generally just a small part of it. Now, how does this help us? And it does, if you're doing, it, it can definitely help across the board. Um, the amount that you can use it varies depending on if you're a plugin developer or you're a theme developer. Um, but it's, it's definitely kind of a weird, thing on the surface. So yes and no, maybe it is, maybe it isn't appropriate. If you're building a theme, then yeah, absolutely. You're going to have JavaScript as part of your theme. You're going to have CSS. It handles all those things. Um, and it doesn't have to output as a, single, as a single bundle. It can output separate files. You can have separate CSS, JavaScript, and images, not one big package like uh, a React or a Vue application. If you're building a plugin, maybe it doesn't matter if you get a big package. Maybe it doesn't matter if there's just a, a single install bundle that is kind of opaque when it comes to the image assets, the JavaScript, the CSS. Um, so just, I'd advise that, you know, keep, keep an open mind. Um, I've built a couple different WordPress plugins that I used to unpack, and I just get a big bundle, and I have a loader for it, and it's, it works fine because it's a, a black box for all its purposes. It, it doesn't really matter. So let's kind of take a step back. You know, I explained what Webpack was at a pretty high level, and now I want to talk about some similar technologies. Um, who here has heard of or worked with Grunt? Okay, a few more people. How about Gulp? Okay. How about Browserify? Hey, there's some people. Great. Um, so, Grunt and Gulp are what are called task runners. Browserify and Webpack are bundlers. A task runner is a very general purpose solution. It basically says you can have a bunch of different things, basically write JavaScript, and it says, okay, execute this, now execute this. 
Um, it's, since it works on Node, you can do almost anything. There are existing plugins um, to build your task, and you can do all sorts of stuff from copy to copy files locally, to copy files to a remote server, to optimize images, to build CSS or JavaScript. Um, a task runner is a very general purpose machine, a very general purpose solution. A bundler is a much more specific solution. Like we said before, it takes a bunch of assets and it puts them together and then you get a bundle at the end. And because it's so specialized, bundlers have some things baked into them that are, can be take more work with a task runner. Um, generally, bundlers, Webpack especially, is uh, a faster and its output than something like uh, grunt definitely, or maybe it's something like go. So that's, that's the main difference. Task runners um, still have their place, they're still good. Bundlers are kind of what people are moving towards in the future. Um, and Webpack especially is sort of the sort of the, the bundler that is at the height of what people are looking at, sort of the forerunner that I think the most common bundler people are, are using. And so why talk about Webpack? You know, this is a JavaScript, I'm sorry, this is a WordPress group. Uh, I talked about how uh, it's mostly a bundler. I talked about how you can use it in themes. You can use it in, in plugins. It's not always the best technology. It, for your purposes, Grunt or Go, a general purpose task runner, may be a better solution if you're building a theme or you're building a plugin. Um, how many people in here uh, create themes? Okay, how about creating plugins? Okay, so it has its place. Webpack may not be the best tool, but I think it's still important to learn about. Uh, it's used in WordPress core. WordPress core recently, within the last six months, switched from Browserify to Webpack for building the JavaScript, which is shipped with WordPress, so that you don't get um, a bunch of files that have white space or are unminified. You have files that are optimized for the web experience. Gutenberg. Is everybody here familiar with Gutenberg? Uh. Okay. Is that a yes, but you don't like it? Uh. Okay. <laughs> Gutenberg is a React app, as far as I know, and it is built with Webpack. Um, so it's kind of, you know, Webpack is really where I think everything is going. People, uh, technologies react, view, it's used in, in WordPress core, Gutenberg. Really, Webpack is the, the build, the bundle technology that everyone's moving towards that I think will be where we are going in the future. So that's why it's important to have some familiarization with it. So let's talk about uh, some concepts. There's four main concepts that you need to understand when we're talking about Webpack. And there's been a recent change with Webpack 3 and Webpack 4 that I will uh, talk about a little bit later. Um, but entry points and output are not quite as important as they used to be. Uh, but we'll run through these concepts. So entry points, you basically say what files you want Webpack to process. Because what, what Webpack will do is it'll go out, it'll look at each of these files, and then it'll find all of the files that they include, and just keep walking down this tree, to matter how deep the import structure is, and bring them together to create its output bundle. So you specify entry points. Uh, it's, you can have them in different formats. This is just an array. You can have them as an object. You can have, if you only have a single one, I think you can have just a single string. If you leave the entries out, there's a default entry, there's a default entry, which is, I believe, source index.js for Webpack 4. The output, this is, once it builds a bundle, where should Webpack write the file that it generates? generally called bundle.js, uh, that's a common name. There's support, you can have it uh, inject a hash so that every time the bundle gets rebuilt, the a, a, a unique string is part of the name and it automatically will break cache when uh, that is distributed through your pages. 
Um, this is a simple example, just writing bundle.js to a distribution tree. Um, but right here, where we have the file name, as I mentioned, you can, there's, there's different variables that are denoted by square brackets that Webpack will support to customize the output name. Loaders. Loaders basically describe how Webpack should handle the content that it sees. And so this is a simple, or this is a loader for uh, SAS content. Is everyone familiar with SAS? Anyone not familiar with SAS? Okay, SAS is a CSS preprocessor. It comes in two variants. There's SASS, S and SCSS. Uh, I prefer the SCSS syntax because you can take any existing CSS file, rename it to .scss, and throw it at SAS, and it'll handle it. It's a very easy to handle pathway. If you have existing CSS, you want to convert to SAS, just rename your file, throw it at a SAS processor, and you can migrate from CSS to SAS. Um, I gave a talk at WordCamp uh, a year and a half ago about SAS that we can direct you to. We can put it in the meetup notes or something if you want to learn more about that. Um, so this is a loader for SAS. You can spec see, we specify a test. So what files should you look at? And that's a re regular expression for any file ending in .scss. And then we specify a bunch of different loaders uh, that Webpack should use when it's processing the file. Webpack loaders always run in reverse order. So it applies the bottom one first, and then the next one up, and then the top one. If you're running, you can also, there's a different format for loaders, which puts them all in one line. Which I don't like that format, because I find this more expressive and better. But if you're using that format, it's from the right to the left. It always processes backwards from when you think it will. That threw me at first, so I really want to make it clear it's from the bottom up. So what this does is first, this runs uh, a SAS loader. So there's a SAS processor runs on it. Uh, and then I like to use uh, post-CSS for some cleanup things. Here I'm just using it for auto-prefixer. And then it runs a CSS loader on it. And what that does is that just basically makes Webpack understand that this is CSS code that's, that's being output. So, we we'll start with a CSS file. Oh, sorry, sorry. We'll start with a SAS file. Our SAS loader turns it into CSS. Our post CSS loader does some things on it to fix the uh, browser prefixes, and then the CSS loader it takes over and it gives it to Webpack. And says, "Okay, this is a CSS file, so that Webpack knows how to handle it." And then there's plugins. Plugins are a way to extend the Webpack behavior. There's a bunch of existing ones. There's core ones. There are third-party ones. There's things for cleaning up uh, the extra files. There's plugins for um, for doing um, excuse me for minifying CSS, for changing how text is output, for extracting instead of writing the CSS into the JavaScript modules. You can use a plugin to write the CSS to a separate file, which is what we would want with WordPress. Um, a bunch of plugins out there. We'll see some examples when we go through building the config file in the second part of the talk. Um, but be aware, those are the four main concepts with Webpack. There's the entry, the output, loaders. Loaders are really the biggest concept. And then there's the plugins. Now, I mentioned Webpack 4 versus Webpack 3. Webpack 4 came out a month or two ago, so it's fairly recent. Um, they spent a lot of effort working on speed and performance. Some people saw as much as 300% uh, performance improvement in their execution. So Webpack 4 is a lot faster. Um, there are some changes under the hood. Plugins built for Webpack 3 probably won't work with Webpack 4. So people have been revising their plugins to work with Webpack 4. Uh, Webpack 4 is what's called zero config. 
Uh, historically, when you work with Webpack, you have to write a config file. And you generally have to get a fairly complicated configuration file. <clears throat> Out of the box, Webpack 4, you can run just with some uh, command line flags. Because it has a default input, it has a default output, it understands how to do JavaScript. And so it was really a big step forward to be able to just install Webpack and then run a command without going through this config file setup process. Something else they've done is they have laid the groundwork for loaders that uh, all of the loaders we looked at uh, for CSS, for post, I'm sorry, for SAS, post CSS, CSS, those are all third party modules that you need to install. Uh, Webpack 4 has laid the groundwork so that in the future they can be incorporated and so that uh, CSS can be understood by Webpack just as well as JavaScript. Right now, we have to go through some hoops to get the CSS output. Uh, with hopefully Webpack 5, it'll work out of the box. We won't have to do extra stuff. So I hit the wrong button. I am excited about that. So yeah, that's it's. I, I was. I don't think it would be in Webpack 4. They kind of talked about it being there. It wasn't before, so we're looking at 5, and it's exciting. And the pace of Webpack development is really fast. Um, Webpack 4, I mentioned, was released a month or two ago. They're already up to 4.4, and they're still you know, pushing forward and making progress. Um, it's a very popular solution, so it's getting a lot of attention, um, and people are really excited about its progress. So now we are going to work, we look at a, a basic walkthrough. Um, first of all, up to this point, does anyone have any questions? Okay. As I'm going through the walkthrough, if you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hand or shout it out and let me know. Um, I'm happy to answer them. And it's, like I said, I've, I've built up sort of a curriculum that we're going to follow. So I don't need to type stuff. What I'm going to be doing is just switching Git branches, bringing up code, showing you things, showing you, okay, this is what it looked like before. Here's what it looks like now. Just to get you some uh, good exposure to building up a Webpack configuration file and the things that you need to think about when you're working on it. Just to clarify, oh, so the main purpose of Webpack is to create either plugins or new themes. The main purpose of Webpack is to create a JavaScript bundle of a web application, a single page application. We are taking that technology and sort of using it on an off-label purpose. So to build that, that single page application, that bundle, it's taking CSS and JavaScript and images and it's processing them and it's outputting a static bundle. We're taking that technology, and so a theme is going to be comprised of CSS, JavaScript, and images. And instead of outputting one single monolithic bundle, we're outputting the JavaScript, taking advantage of its tooling and performance for JavaScript processing. Because the way that I like to write JavaScript for a theme is I have you know, 10 different individual source files that each address a separate piece of the website. But I don't want to send 10 JavaScript files to the browser because it's a performance hit. And so I use JavaScript's Webpack to bundle those 10 files down into one file and optimize it so that it's a smaller, more efficient package. And that gets sent. And since I'm already using Webpack for JavaScript, I might as well also use it for my CSS so that I'm not having to run two different builders. Mm -hmm. And so I'm using it to process the CSS, to process the SAS to get the CSS out again minify and just auto prefixer, so the browser prefix, all those things. Um, so we're we're kind of we're using Webpack in a way that it can be used and it's a perfectly fine implementation usage of it, but it's not the sort of core usage that Webpack was created for. Does that answer your question? It does. Great. Any other questions? Webpack open source product Webpack is open source. So anyone is welcome to contribute to it if you want to download the code. It is um, distributed as an NPM module. Is uh, anyone here not familiar with NPM? Okay. NPM stands for Node Package Manager. 
Node is a, a runtime for JavaScript, which is open source, very common, maintained, I think, by Google. Um, and so it's, you basically you install Node, and that lets you run JavaScript on your computer, on the command line, or run JavaScript things outside of the browser. NPM is a package system for Node. So there's thousands of packages, and you can use, just like you install WordPress plugins, you can install Node packages, and they provide special additional functionality. Maybe it's standalone, maybe it integrates with something else. And so uh, Webpack, all of its plugins, everything that goes into this sort of environment, because working in JavaScript on the command line, it's all installed through NPM. <coughs> and I'm going to mirror the screen so that it's easier. I don't have to keep turning around. I'll switch to the code. OK. Is this a large enough font for people to see? In the back, can you guys see it okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, because I can make it bigger if it would help. Does that make it a little bit bigger? A little bit. Okay. Make it smaller? A no. Bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Perfect. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So, this is <coughs> so I mentioned um, <coughs> NPM and uh, I mentioned NPM and so what we were looking at before uh, just a quick background this is package.json this is a configuration file for this particular project just know that it exists we'll touch on it a few times uh, if you run NPM in it, you can build one yourself in your theme if you're using NPM. Um, I'm not going to get real deep into it, I'm just going to stay focused on Webpack. So I mentioned that there's a zero config implementation with Webpack 4. Right out of the box, we can install Webpack and Webpack CLI, and we can run this is that it's not wrapping. Let me wrap to my window with. There we go. It's still not wrapping. There we go. That's what I want. Okay. So here's two different webpack commands. Uh, one for development and one for production. And if we have a file at source index.js and we run this command, it will output a bundle.js without having any configuration file. This may sound like, you know, what's the big deal? Why am I harping on it? This was a huge improvement for Webpack 4 because, as I said in the past, People were, you had to create this giant config file just to do anything with Webpack. But now you can start to see some perform some benefit, some use right out of the box. Um, so I mentioned this is development, this is production. Can anyone see the difference between the two? <laughs> the mode. Yeah. Mode development versus ah. mode production. Mode is a new uh, flag added, new concept added to Webpack. In the past, any differentiation between development and production came down to your config file. You wrote your config file for dev, you wrote your config file for production. Now, with this mode flag, you can tell Word, you can tell Webpack what you are building for, what's your target, and it'll do it'll either optimize for a better development environment or it'll optimize for production usage. It's just an important thing to call out. And so this just really briefly, this is the no config variation of uh, a webpack. So now we'll switch to, we have a configuration file. And all we have in it 
is, you know what, let me go back. No, we'll see here. Um, we have a configuration file, and all we have in it is a single entry. Just source JS index.js. That's, that's a Webpack config file now. That's all you need if you want a different uh, source file where you, for your entry point. Sorry, that's, that's only still in the webpack.config file? Yes, this is, this is webpack.config.js. So then where does the output and the, um, the output and everything else go to? Uh, by default, output is in dist bundle.js. Okay. And you have to specify a mode and give you a warning if you don't specify a mode on the command line. So that's what the mode is for. Yeah. And all of that you'll find in the JSON file as well. Uh, no, it'll be, well, I can, let me switch to that, package.json, yeah. I set up a script here um, for just building Webpack, okay. um, so I can run npm run build, okay. and that will run the Webpack, it'll pick up the default config file, it'll use what defaults it has, and it will uh, use my entry point, and I'm actually going to jump to the terminal and show you the command. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still on three, so that's, okay. that's nice. Yeah, I mean, it's huge, huge break, breakthrough. It's really nice to have this change in Webpack for it. So let me switch to my terminal. And I will increase the font size. Uh, okay. So... <clears throat> And I'm going to run npm run build. And this command runs webpack. And you can see, I'm sorry, it outputs, uh, it outputs main.js. Um, it's complaining about the mode. I haven't specified a mode. And so it's complaining about that. Uh, so just something to be aware of. So it's picked up the entry point of source JS index.js, that's what we had specified in our um, webpack config file. And it's outputted main.js, which should be in dist. Yes, main.js is right there in dist. So. Uh, the default output is dist, dist is the directory, D-I-S-T, and the file is main.js. And our input file here is really basic. Let me show you what the input looks like. All I'm doing is console.log. Just kind of wanted to have something in there to output. And we'll take a look at what the output looks like. It's messy, is what the output looks like. And that's because Webpack, you know, does a bunch of stuff. And so we had a really small input, and we've got a pretty big output. But it's a contrived scenario. You know, there's, you're going to have a lot more JavaScript for your theme or your plugin than Webpack will add to the bundle. And you can see my JavaScript is right here that gets output. Everything else is a bunch of, of Webpack boilerplate so that it can do what it needs to do for um, includes. Another feature of Webpack, which we won't use that much as WordPress developers, is something called chunking. But if you're building a single page application, you can have Webpack not output one giant, you know, two megabyte JavaScript file. It can be chunked into separate pieces that are various sizes and only loaded as necessary so that the performance of the initial load of an application can be better and then it just brings the additional pieces when it needs them. Um, so this is, and I, we're kind of taking baby steps here in terms of, you know, no configuration, very basic configuration. We'll go to a little more complicated configuration file. So now we're specifying, we'll specify a mode. If we go back to the package.json, I'm now specifying two different modes. So I have two different build scripts. One for production and one for development. 
if we look at the Webpack configuration, the Webpack configuration is the same, hasn't changed. But because of this mode flag, I can build two different targets with the same Webpack configuration. I can build development, I can build production with the same configuration. And we will oops, drop to Webpack to the command line here. And I'm going to run build again. And now you can see it specified the mode because it's baked into my command. Oops, the mode is right here. Um, it's output main.js, and it is not very big. 568 bytes is not that big. Now we'll run the dev version. Almost 3K. And so the reason it's that big is because when you're doing, when you're working in development, you don't want the smallest possible uh, file size. You want a bunch of information so that when you're debugging, when you're looking at what codes run, you can tell where in your code uh, something was done. One of the things Webpack does is because it minifies, it takes your code, which is organized a certain way, your JavaScript, and it changes it so that what runs in the browser does not look like what you wrote. And it can be very difficult to debug unless you have some way to map from what you wrote to what's in the browser. And we'll cover that a little bit more, but the reason the development version is so large is to, quote, to support that mapping uh, from production, from the, the finished bundle back to your original source. So now, we're gonna, it's gonna get more interesting. We're gonna add CSS. So if we look at the source here, uh, you can see I've added a CSS file, very basic CSS file, okay? And if we go and we look at the Webpack config, uh, I'm specifying a CSS loader, okay? Now we are, but we our entry point, you can see, the entry point doesn't say anything about CSS. So how does the CSS get into the Webpack process? Anybody have any ideas? Okay. This is one of the things I like least about the way that it sort of works in a single page app. You import your CSS into JavaScript. It's common, people in the React world uh, may even view or very excited about it. I'm not a big fan, it just feels wrong to me. This is the way where you're supposed to do it out of the box, but we can specify multiple entry points, and as you, when we get to that point, you will see that there's a different way to do it. But, we are bringing the CSS here in via JavaScript. I'm going to run build dev. And you can see that it does find the CSS and it finds a JS, but it only outputs a JS file. We don't output a CSS file because all of our CSS is bundled up into the JavaScript. And that's what we're trying to, we'll avoid uh, in later steps. Now we're going to be able to get away from that JavaScript import. I've updated the Webpack config, so now we have two different entry points. We have one for JavaScript, we have one for CSS. And I've named them, so bundle and style. The name is used by default. The, excuse me, object key is the default name of the output file. So when Webpack processes these files, it will output a style.js and a bundle.js. And no, I did not misspeak. So no more extract text plugin for CSS? Um, yes and no. We need that concept right now. Extract text is being phased out. It has not been updated for Webpack for 
there's a different plugin which achieves the same thing, which is targeted Webpack 4, which builds on the changes that have been made in Webpack 4 for future loaders. Um, and that, we'll get to that a little bit later. So, we're here, we've got two different entry points. I will run the command. And you can see, we've outputted bundle.js and style.js. Webpack only understands JavaScript out of the box. It only knows how to create JavaScript. And so it's taken our CSS and it wrote it into a JavaScript file, which is not what we want. Um, sorry, what do you mean? No, you asked the question about um, yeah. extract text? Yeah, Kevin. Ken? Kevin. Kevin? Yes. So Kevin was talking about extract text. That's the way with Webpack 3, you've taken and told uh, Webpack, okay, this particular kind of content, don't write a JavaScript file for me. Pull it out, treat it as text, and just write it to some other file name that you specify. And so there's a similar but different technique that we will use. for under Webpack 4. And so the Webpack config now is getting it's getting bigger. There's more stuff in it. We have, we still have our multiple entry points. We still have our loader down here, the CSS loader. But now we've added a plugin, mini CSS extract plugin. And so we have to load the code, we have to declare it as a plugin and then we have to add it to our loader chain. And what this will do is this will tell Webpack, okay, when you encounter CSS content, pull it out and write it as a separate file. And write it as a file named style.css. So this is moving towards our goal of using Webpack but keeping our assets separate. When I run the dev, run the build, um, you can see now, great, we've got style.css, but we still have style.js, and we've got bundle.js. So that's, you know, we're, we're part of the way there, and, but we don't really want style.js right now. There's no reason for it. We're not going to use it. And so we can step forward again to uh, use a different plugin called Extraneous File Cleaner. And what this will do is this will uh, look at what's been output and we've configured it so that any file that is less than four, any .js file that's less than 4,000 bytes, it'll delete it. We don't want that file. That's, those are the ones that it generates for us uh, from CSS that we don't want. As I said, hopefully in Webpack 5, this won't be an issue. We won't have to go through these hoops, but right now we do. Um, just so that you're aware of extraneous file cleanup, I, the existing plugin only works with Webpack 3, but throws an error with Webpack 4. Um, I have fixed my local copy, and I've submitted a pull request, but I need to make some changes before it'll accept it. So right now, you can't easily make this plugin work with Webpack 4, just to be aware. So now what we'll do is we'll drop back to the command line, We'll run the build again, and we only have style.css. What happened to our bundle? Well, our bundle.js was too small. It fell below the threshold. You know, if we go back up and look here, our bundle.js was only 2.85k. So that's, that's, you know, it's smaller than style.js. And again, we're dealing with a contrived example, but I want to point it out that something that you, when you're going through this process yourself, if you're doing this, be aware stuff like this can happen. Um, Webpack puts out you know, a lot of information about what it's doing and where it's doing things and how big files are. Um, and I find myself, I periodically will have a file drop off and I'll have to go and tweak that uh, threshold in the Webpack config file. So now we will jump to SAS support. 
So before I was just doing CSS, now I'm doing SAS. And so if we scroll down here, in addition to uh, the CSS loader, I've put in a very simple SAS loader. So it looks for SCSS files, it runs a SAS loader, and then the CSS loader, then it extracts the text to a separate file. Run the dev, and we're still getting a style.css file out. <clears throat> it's a little bit of a bigger file. Um, and if we go and we look here in dist, um, you can see I changed our source, so we have the SAS file now. I'm doing that. <clears throat> I wanted to just do some actual SAS nested tags um, so that it was actual SAS, and then the output is visible here. Um, so we are processing SAS, we are getting CSS out. Everything is working as we expect. So I'll jump ahead to now at the post CSS support. Again, we looked at this a little bit, it's very similar to what we saw before um, bringing in our prefixer adding it to our load chain. The post-CSS requires a little bit more configuration, so we have to use a more complicated uh, loader specification here. But now, if we look at my source, I added box sizing so that we could just see that the browser prefixes get added in the generated CSS. See, look, it's got the browser prefix as necessary. And this is just going through and building up our Webpack config step by step. Okay, I need to do this, let me add it. I need to do this, let me add it. Um, and again, this is all in a public repo, so you can all go home and look at it further uh, as you want. So now, let's look at... I mentioned... Before production, the actual like built JavaScript is different from your source. And you use something called a source map to configure, to, to map between what is built, what the browser loads, and what the uh, your source is. Did you have a question, Ryan? Yeah, for the browser prefixing, can you specify how far back you want to go into your individual project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, sort of the default and what I've done in the Webpack config is uh, I said last two versions. Oh, perfect. But you can go, there's, there's a whole bunch of documentation on what auto prefixer understands. But it is configurable. That's it's cool. absolutely configurable. Yeah, awesome. Can you go back to IE8? Maybe. No. Just keep in mind. Uh, Auto prefixer, what I'm doing here, it doesn't um, like say, oh, you know, you have a floated thing with a margin, and so IE6 is going to double your margin, so we need to do, I can't remember what the fix is anymore for that. Um, it's not going to do fixes like that. Auto prefixer will say, okay, you're using this rule, this CSS rule. Uh, the other older browsers understand the rule in this format, so let me translate this rule. It's Great, it's very helpful, but it's not a panacea. Um, but again, I you know I don't work on projects without it just because I don't know what the rules are anymore. I don't remember. I just write modern CSS and it outputs things the browsers understand. <laughs> uh, so I mentioned source maps. What we've done here is a couple things. Uh, Webpack understands source maps by default. However, because we are doing some changes in uh, CSS, Webpack does not understand the CSS stuff, and so we have to tell our CSS tools to generate a source map so that at each stage, there's the code changes. And so we need to know, okay, excuse me, SAS, makes a change, auto prefixer makes a change, the CSS loader makes a change, 
And at each of those points, we build up this map of what changed so we can go from what the browser sees back to our original source. And I will bring that up in the browser and show you what it looks like. So this is uh, the page, a very simple HTML page. There's really nothing to it. And this bigger. We could see, so here's an H1. And So we have an H1, and we have the styles. This is the WebKit DevTools Inspector. Is anyone not familiar with this? OK, great. Um, so over here, we see our H body H1. We can see the source file, style.scss, where the change actually is. It's not pointing at the location in the CSS file, because we don't care where it's in the CSS file. We care where it is in the SCSS file. And it's the source map which lets us, gives us that behavior, that benefit, so that we see where the change was actually, where the, the uh, rule actually exists. And for both of these, you can see it's in here, style SCSS. Uh, they're both in style SCSS. If I turn off, let me turn that off. You can see it's saying where the rules to find in the CSS file. So that's the big benefit of the source maps. At source maps, it's not a webpack thing. You know, grunt, go, any technology uh, will be able to generate a source map for you. Even if you're just doing um, just a, like a, a GUI tool on your desktop, it should gen be able to generate a source map so that you get this behavior. Now we will jump into some JavaScript, and we're actually doing some JavaScript now. So one of the things we could do here is uh, I can bring in a library, an external library, and I can just say require, it's assigned to a variable, and then use it, um, and it's fine. Now, a lot of modern browsers won't understand that. And so, again, we're taking advantage of Webpack, so it will translate this, which it understands because it's running in Node, and it will, it will bundle our code along with the lodash clone deep function all up into one file so that then the browser can actually do what we want it to do. So this is where we're starting to take advantage of what uh, Webpack is really made for. And you'll see our bundle.js file is larger. So now it's back again. It's really big, 51K for what we're doing is pretty big. That's because we're building a development model. It has a bunch of other information in it that's not necessary in production. So if we jump back to Chrome, we can see in the console that our JavaScript is running. We have a very simple, we're loading bundle.js, that's a generated file, and our code works correctly. It, it does execute in the browser. I'm gonna turn this off. Let me 
screen's yellow. Now. But there's no new rules for JavaScript, like we had to add for CSS. And that's because Webpack natively understands the JavaScript. So now we will jump to images. And I'm adding images to our CSS. You can see there's two images here. There's an SVG and there's a JPEG. So let me show you what happens here. Before I do anything with the configuration, I'll run the build. We will load it here. You can see the images appear. Um, if we look here at this uh, after pseudo element, that's the SVG. Webpack has inlined it as a data URL. If we look at the photo, which I'm doing as um, a background image just for purposes of the demonstration, that is not what I had called it in the CSS. And so Webpack, we're using a, a plugin here that has the ability to inline images that are smaller than a certain file size for performance. You don't need a bunch of downloads of 500 byte images. It sees that this image is small enough, so it just inlines it in the CSS as a data URL. Similarly, it generates this uh, other image. It generates its name as a hash, so you don't have to deal with cache issues. If the image changes, it generates as a different hash, and will automatically, the browser will see it as a different image and pull it in. So you're not dealing with any uh, far features, stale data, browser cache issues. Take a quick look at the configuration. All we had to do here was I had to add a loader for images. So any of these image formats, if it sees them, and Webpack applies these loaders to all of the resources it sees. You know, I'm not I'm not adding an entry point for an image. Webpack processes the CSS, sees the images in the CSS, finds the right loader, and applies that loader to what it sees in the CSS, or what it sees in the JavaScript. Um, so there's, it's, it's really smart about how it applies these processes. So we specified a URL loader. URL loader is for, it has a limit, so if it's below 8,192 8, bytes, it will inline as a data URL. If it's bigger than that, it will output as a separate file, and it uses a loader called File Loader to do that, which URL, URL loader automatically falls back to File Loader when it needs to. I'm going to cover one more thing here. So, up to this point, you know, we have had one. Uh, webpack config. Now, because we're adding, it's a way of differentiating between production and development just based on that mode. That's the only thing different between production and development at this point. And that can get you a long ways, but you reach a point where you, know, you, you may want to apply certain optimizations to production that are your own customization, your own um, processes, not just what Webpack wants to do. Uh, one of the things is when you um, when you look at that extraneous file cleanup, files in production are going to be a lot smaller than files in development. So your threshold 
needs to be lowered. I had to drop it back to 1,000, otherwise it was deleting my bundle.js file just because it was optimized. Uh, I like to output a different CSS file. So I know that the one that's dash prod is optimized for production. And so, to me, I'll frequently generate both, have the dev in my development environment, have the prod in production. And then uh, in my theme, when it does the styling queue, it'll enqueue the proper file based on the environment, based on either an environment flag or some other setting. But I'll enqueue a different file in different locations so that I'm seeing my development version development, production and production. And this is done through, it's hard to read, but this is a webpack.prod.js. I also have a webpack.dev.js. And there is a webpack.common.js. Um, right up here, we, have, we load a merge tool, we load a common config file, and we bring them together. So anything that's shared between the two is maintained in common. So that, you know, our image loader is the same for both, so that's in common. Uh, I've added a new plugin to clean up the output, that's in common. My entry points are the same for both, that's in common. And so this is just a way to organize the code better, to have these two different configuration files. Um, it's 7.45 now. Um, I could keep going, I could stop. Uh, you know, I can flip, flip back to my presentation and kind of quickly gloss over. Um, I had slides for all of this stuff, but we jumped through code. So let me just say, I'll do a quick reprise. So configuration, you don't need a configuration file. Um, we looked at that. Uh, we first looked at it with a single entry, and so we only had one entry in our Webpack config. Uh, we looked at specifying the mode, production versus development. We looked at adding CSS, and so we had to add the loader, and then we had to bring the CSS into JavaScript. Uh, we looked at separating them out, having a separate entry for JS versus CSS. Switching from uh, CSS to, or, I'm sorry, pulling the CSS out into a separate file. We looked at cleaning up so we don't get that style.js style file, uh, adding SAS support so that we could deal with, work with SAS, not CSS, uh, post CSS for browser prefixes, source maps so we can better understand how, where we make changes in our source for the browser, uh, JavaScript, bringing things in, images, uh, the URL loader, and the source, uh, specifying images in the source, but then Webpack creating the hashed file or the inline data URL. And we talked about development versus production with separate configuration files. Anybody have questions about any of that? Brian? Is there a JS linter built into Webpack? There is not, no. There's not? Can you use a third party tool? Yes. When you run that, where does the, uh, the errors or the warnings show? Is it in the terminal pack in the middle? Uh, depend on the it depends on how you incorporate it. But okay. generally, yes, you would have it, it would be in the terminal output. Okay, cool. So, um, a few other things. Uh, I mentioned minification. JavaScript, uh, sorry, Webpack does what's called uh, tree shaking, and where if you have code, that you're not using, Webpack can automatically remove that code from the generated bundle. And so you get a smaller uh, bundle size. It's one of the other great benefits of Webpack. Uh, Babel. Babel is what's called a transpiler. In JavaScript, most browsers understand what's called ES5, which is a version of JavaScript from almost a decade ago. But JavaScript has moved forward since then with Node. There's you know, ES6, ES2015, 2016, 2017, now 2018. Babel is a technology that you can put into your Webpack stack, which, where you can write modern 
JavaScript in ES27 syntax with uh, let, with const, with splats, with classes, just arrow operator, a bunch of stuff you can do in modern JavaScript. Babel will convert that to JavaScript that browsers will understand. So you can write in a modern format, but ship the format the browsers expect. You can plug that into your stack. Can um, you briefly uh, discuss converting an existing code base using Babel? Uh, Kidding. <laughs> that's not what it's used for. It, Babel does not generate code that you want to look at. That just generates code for the browser. Live reload, there's multiple ways to make a change in your JavaScript, refresh your browser. Um, it, if you're doing a JavaScript app, there's something called Hot Module Reload, which is default with Webpack. There's Browser Sync, I prefer Live Reload. All of these slides I'm running through, there are branches in my repository which show configuration using these technologies so you can go back and look at them. Um, similarly, external jQuery. WordPress ships to jQuery. You don't want to bundle your own jQuery. You don't want to take jQuery and bundle a second copy into your, your code that you generate. So you can tell Webpack, okay, anytime I say I'm using jQuery, don't actually bring it into the bundle. Just assume it already exists. And we can use Webpack's jQuery, I'm sorry, we can use WordPress's jQuery. Okay, that's it. Um, here are a number of resources I used to put the talk together. Um, this is a, a really nice tutorial on Webpack 4 and what changed. Webpack itself has great documentation, very verbose, uh, very readable. I highly recommend it. It's a great resource to take a look at. This is the repo with all the code that we looked at from my talk. Um, and I will also make these slides available. Um, and this is an article which explains what's the deal with uh, the different versions of JavaScript, which can be helpful. Awesome. So.